I want to let uh, assure you and uh, the other speakers who, to whom I've already talked a number of times about how important it is to stay within limits, that um, we have a little flexibility here. One of the speakers who was scheduled for this afternoon, Dr. Craig Reinerman, was unable to be here. He, he took off or he got in a plane. He didn't take off. He sat on the runway for seven hours and finally the, the flight was canceled. So he will not be here. So I, I am quite aware of the, of the time restrictions here, but we're going, to be, we're going to be fine given the fact that we have a few minutes to, to work with uh, here and a little, a little later on. Um, we will have opportunity at the end of the afternoon to talk, to ask questions that may not have got asked so far to, to uh, all, of, all of the people who are all of the members of the panels today or the speakers today. This session has to do with health issues, and some, some drugs are bad for your health. Uh, others are not. I take uh, Claritin and Zocor daily. I have on occasion benefited from Valium, Vicodin, Percocet, Percodan, Morphine, all of which can lead to dependence. As it happens, I'm not dependent on any of those. Uh, I don't think I'm dependent on good wine, but I don't plan to stop drinking it to test that hypothesis. <laughs> Even though I know that without question, alcohol is the drug that causes the greatest amount of individual and social harm in, in our society. The relationship between drugs, individual and, and, uh, and, and health, individual and public, is a complex one in, in involving far more than the simple dictum that if, if they're legal, they're okay, and if they're illegal, they're bad. Uh, we can't look at all these issues, but we can look at some of them, and we'll have opportunity to look at others of them in, in subsequent gatherings of, uh, today and tomorrow. Today, for this session, we are uh, uh, fortunate to have the benefit of some considerable expertise. Our first speaker, first presenter is Ernest Drucker, Dr. Ernest Drucker, professor of epidemiology and social medicine at the Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, and editor-in-chief of addiction research and theory. He's also one of the pioneer researchers and writers on the topics of drugs, uh, drug prohibition, and public health. We're pleased to invite uh, and have Dr. Drucker with us now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I ask your indulgence because, believe it or not, this is the first time I've used PowerPoint uh, for anything other than savings thing in my computer because they informed me that the place was so high tech they couldn't show the little slides I usually use. So I've picked out a few of them. We think we've got them successfully in here and I'll use sign language and <laughs> wave my hands around for, to make up for the difference. What I, what I want to talk today about is um, uh, a kind of an overview of some of the basic ways of looking at the data, which I know there's been some discussion about what we know and don't know, uh, what's true and isn't true about what we know about drug use and its consequences in this country, at least, which, which I study the most. And, and I undertook a few years ago to try to pull this together and it, in a publication in this journal, which is the uh, Public Health Reports, which is the, uh, actually the official journal of the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, and through a, you know, through a fluke of, 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 of um, chance that a friend of mine was the editor for a while, was able to get uh, what I think is a very uh, um, uh, assaultive piece on American drug policy into the drug journal of the U.S. Public Health Service. And there it is. It's on the web, uh, available uh, through the U.S. Public Health Service and through Drug Tax and through the Drug Policy Alliance, Linda Smith Library. And what I tried to do was to pull together the evidence that bears on the consequences of our drug policy uh, from a public health point of view for the last 25 years. And the policy is drug prohibition, and it has consequences. So let's see if this works. Here we go. Um, this is a, a, an image that you're used to by now, and it's the growing budget. Um, it's a piece of the growing budget uh, associated with um, drug uh, um, 
enforcement for the most part, but the federal drug budget. And as has been pointed out before, the federal drug budget is really only a small part of the overall budget. For, so, so all the arrests and prosecutions of drug use, all the enforcement activities, uh, they generally bear on the states. States pay for prison systems, which is most of prison cells in the country. They uh, police are a local expense, municipality, county, state. Um, courts are a local expense. So this, this, these numbers, which get up to about $20 billion today, and even those, uh, as Alex Wodak was pointing out, are notional budgets, because they do is take a piece of defense, a piece of justice, a piece of other um, um, budgets, and put them together and say, well, here's the effort. But even so, you can see the trend, and that is we have invested very deeply uh, in, in the model of prohibition and its logical conclusion, which is enforcement and incarceration of people, having gone up from about half a million people to two million people behind bars, with a lot of that growth being associated with drug enforcement. So, you know, we, we're consistent. We have a policy and we have applied it, um, and, and uh, we can see what result it's had. Oops. Um, and this is a simplified way of looking at it. And these, these are reports from that National Household Survey that people were discussing before. And from 1972 to 96, I don't have the more recent stuff, but it goes up a little bit on, on, on that side. And these, these are minus the marijuana use. So the household survey um, involves sampling households uh, in, in key districts around the country. It's about 50,000 people a year are surveyed. I don't know if they actually knock on their door. They may use telephone. Um, but it's, it's a sample, and it's been done the same way every, every year by the University of Michigan under a contract, National Institute on Drug Abuse. And it's kind of the gold standard of prevalence of drug use. They do cigarettes, alcohol, uh, as well as illicit drugs. And, and the contours of this thing are very clear, uh, that they were at a certain level of around 2% of the adult population that's 12 years and older, uh, saying they'd used some illicit drug other than marijuana in the last year, and uh, in the last month, excuse me, it's past month use. And that peaks up in about 85, and that's mostly cocaine associated with that peak, and then it drops back down about where it was before. And if you were to look at heroin use in that period, it would be at about the 1% level going across the bottom. Uh, something around a million people have used cocaine in the last month, million and a half. And hasn't uh, mar her heroin, rather, I'm sorry. Whereas the big jump was cocaine, and then all the other drugs, amphetamines, ecstasy, LSD, they're all buried in that. But cocaine and heroin are the big ones. In this. Um, so as associated with this policy, you see a period in the uh, 70s where expenditures, let me go back a step, uh, expenditures were really not, this, 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 you can't quite pick it up, the expenditures were still low at this end, and you do see uh, drug use uh, um, climbing a bit during this period. Then the expenditures increase, and drug use goes up as they increase, and then it begins to go down again. And this is that cocaine epic, and a lot of thought about what that means, and a lot of writing about what that, that change has meant. But as best those of us who've worked in, clinically and in the field can tell, is that the initial burst of enthusiasm for cocaine, which was certainly fueled by the availability of the drug, a drug that had always been available in small amounts, became available in massive amounts, at higher purity, lower price, greater access, and everybody tried it. And some people liked it. And some people liked it so much, it, uh, it made their lives miserable. And the word of that got out. And then they began to back off from it. And I think there's never given enough credit to the fact of community response to a drug, uh, understanding what it does, and beginning to modulate the use in a community to account for the fact that this drug makes you crazy. This drug kills you. We remember back from the 60s, this, we went through this with methamphetamine in the Northeast. Speed, speed kills was the slogan at the time. It had nothing to do with enforcement. It had to do with an awareness that this drug was extremely harsh and difficult to deal with, and people had alternative drugs they could use. They always have and they always will. And we think that's a lot, what, a lot of what happened with cocaine, certainly the publicity of the crack epidemic, the publicity of the lives ruined by cocaine uh, dependency, were enough publicity for most people who had any control over their lives uh, to withdraw from the use, such that even in areas of, of, the, of New York City, uh, which were um, really besieged by the crack trade in the 80s, by the early 90s had backed away completely, such that you could not buy crack in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. You could in the Bronx. It's always a very local business, what the, trades, what the trade is like, what the markets are like. But we know many instances where communities, uh, uh, where crack, crack and crack deals became so marginalized and actually hunted down in some cases by local vigilante groups 
that they could no longer function. And the drug had such a bad reputation that uh, crack disappeared, but it didn't go away to re be replaced by nothing. It was often replaced by heroin or by uh, marijuana mixed with heroin. Uh, something was always there. Or by Colt 45. Uh, you know, there's always another drug there waiting. Colt 45 costs less than Snapple, by the way, in most inner city neighborhoods. Um, now, what happened during the same period of time, roughly, to some of the consequences of, of drug use? We talk about morbidity and mortality in public health, morbidity being illness, mortality being death. And this is the more, one of the principal morbidity measures, which is uh, a drug-related uh, emergency department admissions, uh, non-fatal overdoses. And you can see that a lot of them were associated with cocaine, uh, and that overtook heroin uh, for a period and still has, actually. There are many more uses of cocaine, I should point out, than there are of heroin, probably six or seven to one ratio. So that means that the rate, actually, the rate of overdoses for heroin is probably higher than for cocaine, but numerically, the cocaine's more important. Uh, there was a time in New York City in the 80s at the peak of the cocaine epidemic when 25% of auto fatalities tested positive for cocaine. And all the auto fatalities aren't the users necessarily, uh, aren't the uh, the, the people involved in auto fatalities are half victims and half perpetrators, if you will, the person who was driving under the influence. So quite likely among the people responsible for the accidents, and maybe half were associated with cocaine. That gives you a sense of how much cocaine was in the city in that period, enormous amounts, and very widespread, very commonly used, as commonly as alcohol, perhaps. And that was reflected, and that moved out around across the country, and was reflected in these, in these emergency department admissions. And you can see that the shape of this curve has nothing to do let me get this right, whoops, has nothing to do with the shape of that curve. And it's functioning quite independently, so although low, use is lower, the cocaine use has gone down, by this measure at least, um, the overdoses are going up. And there's two possible explanations for that. One is that the surveys are wrong, and we had some discussion of that this morning, that there in fact are more users than the surveys acknowledge, and that's quite likely, since all the, for all the reasons that we discussed this morning. But the other possibility also is that drug use has become more dangerous in this period. And one of the things we know that makes drug use more dangerous is vigorous enforcement and incarceration. So concretely, um, a person who's using heroin, managing a habit in some way over a period of time, gets arrested, spends a few days in a jail, maybe a few weeks in a, in a, in a, in a jail, and then if they can't make, make bail, stays there longer, and if they get convicted, goes upstate. Um, but most people, I'd say probably a ratio of about 10 or 15 to 1, that jail episode is the, is the principal activity of incarceration for them. They're out again for another episode. Uh, with a ratio, we, we go through about 100,000 people a year in New York City through Rikers Island uh, with an average length of stay of a week. And one of the things that does if you have a heroin habit is essentially it, it, it destabilizes that habit. You lose tolerance. Your body has become accustomed to having so much heroin every day. You lose that tolerance. Each day you're in, in jail, uh, your tolerance goes down. And what's the first thing you do when you get out of jail? You go back to the street, and you're pretty miserable at this time. You've gone through withdrawal in jail, often untreated. Although in Rikers Island, we did treat with methadone. We did treat withdrawal with methadone. But most jails don't do that. They may give Midol or something pretty modest to treat withdrawal symptoms. But people are sort of left on their own for the most part. And one of the first things that happens when they get out of jail because they're still in a fairly intense state of drug craving, having had a habit, is to go back and use a dose of a drug that was safe before they went in, but isn't safe when they got out because the tolerance has gone down. And that's just a part of the picture. But studies have been done looking at the, what happens in the first week after discharge from jail, as opposed to the second week and the third week. And it's clear there's a burst of overdose events in that period of time. Oops. Down. Uh, now, this is the... Uh, the harder part. This is the deaths. Uh, and that number has continued to climb. It's over 10,000 a year now. These are the overdose deaths in the United States. The vast majority of those associated with heroin, although often in combination with alcohol, pills, and sometimes cocaine. Uh, and, um, and that's a very powerful message about the consequences of our drug policy. Whatever, whatever, however it functions, this is an undeniable fact, again, which was mentioned this morning. Uh, that says something is wrong, that we've created a situation where I even if more people are using the drug than before, I doubt if it's five times as many people use There's no indication that there are five times as many heroin users as there were 25 years ago. 
but there are five times as many deaths. And that suggests, because this curve is almost identical to the curve of incarceration growth in the same period, much of it associated with heroin use, that suggests some relationship between those two events. Now, the imprisonment you know, can, have the, can have the effect I mentioned by the, by the mechanism of, uh, I, I discussed, but that may not be the only, it's not the only thing going on. You obviously have destabilization of lives. People lose their apartments. They lose whatever job they had. They lose the social networks that they were dependent on. They come out of jail and try to re-enter that world. There's a lot of stresses around that. We know a lot of the uh, homicides in this period, when that burst of homicides in New York involved the churning of small-scale drug dealers who were knocked off the corner and came out of jail back to that corner, but there's someone else there and they had a gun waiting for them. So a lot of the homicide was driven by this as well. And these are, these are the mortality, public health consequences, the most dramatic consequences of our drug policy in its entirety. Now, you can't possibly see that. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what this is, is the, to, a, a slide to show the, the different rates of overdose change by cities, by the major cities in the United States. And I'll, I'll read it for you. Uh, the numbers are not critical, but there are, are basically tremendous differences in the change of overdose rates in the 10-year period. We looked in the 1990s. And uh, from Los Angeles up on the top, which went down 3% in the period 1990 to 97, to Baltimore at the bottom, which went up 400% in overdose deaths in this period. Uh, so we use the same measure to look at different cities, and the point is they're all over the place. They go from minus 3%, those ones up on the top um, range up to about 30% increase, the ones in the middle from 30 to 75, the ones on the bottom from 80 to 400% increase. So there's a lot of variance. There's a lot of specific differences about what's going on in different communities. And this is one way of seeing some of those uh, just laid out another way, the green dots represent the uh, range of drug uh, of drug induced deaths per hundred thousand population, and um, the bars in the red and blue represent the range within that city in that same seven year period. So you see there are tremendous differences between cities, and within cities you see them moving around quite a bit within this period. So there's a lot of activity going on. This is a sensitive measure. It's sensitive to us, and we don't, we don't know exactly what's going on that makes, these, makes this happen, but we have some insight into some of the trends related to it. So for example, in the smaller cities, um, if I go back, whoops, this one. The smaller cities up on top, uh, on the bottom rather, which actually by American standards includes Oklahoma City, New Orleans, Washington, Norfolk, Philadelphia, not as big as Los Angeles and, and New York up on top, um, we have actually higher rates of increase in this period. And in those cities, we were able to see rates of increase that were greater among young people than among old people. Most overdose deaths happened to the group over 30 years of age. But in these smaller cities, we began to see people in their 20s being represented more heavily in the overdose statistics, suggesting the establishment of new markets. And anyone who has been out and about in this country in the last 10 years has seen heroin in cities where you didn't see it in the 1980s. So I, I spent time in a little town up in western Massachusetts called Great Barrington. In the, in the last three years, we've had the first heroin busts in the town, the first heroin overdose cases reported uh, in a, you know, a pristine part of the Berkshires uh, of, of America. And, and that, that, those markets getting saturated in the cities, in the big cities, uh, where you see a flattening of the use of heroin and the increased production of heroin in the world and the aggressive marketing of it moves that drug out to other localities which didn't use it before. So heroin is now available much more widely in the United States than it was before. And, and, and the overdose deaths are, are a good way of keeping track of that. Unfortunately, the way the data are gathered for the most part by the federal agencies that report on it do not make it easy to do that. You'd think it would be the kind of thing like air pollution or water pollution or, um, or, or population growth, birth rates, that would just be there in a way that any normal person could look at them and see what's going on, but they're not. They're, they, 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 the definitions of what the areas are, the data are collected from change from year to year. Uh, the groups that are, are, are included and excluded change from time to time. And it's very hard to make comparisons across years, and we had to devote a lot of energy to do this. I worked with Jamie Garfield on this. But the kind of thing that should be the most fundamental measure of how we're doing with a drug problem is not readily accessible to citizens who wish to. And it's one of the things we try to correct in some of our work is to make these data available on the web. Um, going to Deborah Small's remarks, a uh, similar kind of pattern can be seen in these overdose deaths. 
the red bars are uh, our, uh, our black African-American population. Uh, the blue uh, is white and the yellow is other. Um, and uh, with all the problems of definition and who's included in and isn't, the, the differences are so dramatic that it's very clear that the, that the overdose rates among uh, African-Americans are anywhere from 40% to 100% higher than among whites throughout this period. Despite all the evidence that we can find that the prevalence of drug use is not significantly different or, or, or regularly different between African-American and white populations in the United States. This drug may be higher at this moment, that one at that moment, it can change over time. But by and large, all the evidence that we do have from the same national surveys indicates that the prevalence of drug use by race and ethnicity is pretty much the same. And yet, you see this difference in, um, in, in outcomes, in overdose deaths. Uh, and this, again, resonates with what we know about the differences in incarceration rates. Because around incarceration and all that goes with it, we know that drug use becomes more dangerous. And here are some of the numbers on that. Um, these are the percentage increase in overdose deaths for, for, from 1980 to 85, uh, blacks versus, versus African Americans versus others, 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 93. And you can see a steady climb in the differential and in the, in the differential impact of overdose on, on populations. Okay. Now, I'd like to mention a few other things that I, I don't have pictures for, but are pretty straightforward. Um, you can't talk about AIDS. You can't talk about the drug issue and intravenous drug use in the United States without talking about AIDS. Uh, intravenous drug use has become the centerpiece of the AIDS epidemic in the United States. There are more new cases associated with injecting drug use than there are with sexuality. Uh, in the United States, it's about 20,000 cases per year, uh, new cases per year associated with injecting drug use. Globally, probably one to two million new cases a year associated with, with injecting drug use. Injecting drug use around the world is what's driving the AIDS epidemic. It represents the opportunity to introduce the infection into new countries, gets a foothold among drug users, they give it to their sexual partners, and then it becomes a sexually transmitted disease that's, that's running. We, the, the most the dramatic cases of this have been in, in Thailand uh, 10 years ago, in uh, India five years ago, uh, China most recently, and the epidemics of HIV around the world are being ignited by intravenous drug use. I, I was recently in Africa and learned about the spread of intravenous heroin use in Africa, which is very ominous, not for just all the obvious reasons, but because uh, these are countries which already have 10 to 20 percent infection rates among adults. And once you begin to combine that with a frequency of injection and sharing that goes along uh, with heroin use, and we've seen this now in Nigeria, in Kenya, South Africa, that you have the potential for absolutely catastrophic outcomes. So what we do about drugs in the United States, the United States is the world leader uh, in determining international treaties and policies about the treatment of drug use and how countries react to drug use, has enormous consequences for the AIDS epidemic, which is growing very rapidly uh, in, in, in those portions of the world that contain two-thirds of the population, Africa, Asia, uh, China, South America. Um, on the other side of it here at the United States, uh, we have the longest uh, track record of experience in developing effective treatment for heroin addiction, intravenous drug use. And that is the use of methadone and more recently buprenorphine, uh, another opiate substitution treatment that's very effective. You heard about the Swiss heroin trials, and we'll hear more about those later. Uh, we've been extremely constipated in the United States in moving ahead with the availability of methadone. Even though that treatment was developed here, there's been very little way in the way of movement in the expansion of that treatment to make it available to people in this country. So uh, 15 years ago, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, we had about 140,000 methadone treatment slots in the United States. Now we're up to about 200,000, but that still accounts for only about 15 or 20 percent of the in injection drug using population in this country. And it's very hard to expand that because the clinic system that we have as a requirement, you cannot prescribe methadone and pharmacists cannot dispense it. You must go to a methadone clinic, which is an assemblage of anywhere from 100 to 600 patients in one place coming in three or four times a week to get their methadone. They hate it. The staff hates it. The community hates it. And you ain't opening any more of those clinics in the United States so easily. Uh, 
but we go out of the United States to Canada, to Australia, to Britain, to Europe, and you see another model in which methadone treatment is normalized, doctors prescribe, pharmacists dispense, and you see numbers like 40% and 50% and 70% market penetration, if you will, uh, of, of prescribed opiates to an opiate-dependent population, which has enormous consequences. Obviously, for them, clinically, a chance to get out of the rat race of having to acquire three bags of heroin a day to shoot and all the things that go with that in, in, in crime and, and, and loss of dignity and living that life, but also in terms of deflating those heroin markets in those communities. And, and it really is something to see. When you go to a community that's well covered, you cannot buy heroin. There's no, there's no market to sell it to. There are other drugs to be sold, to be sure, and there always will be. But heroin happens to be the one that we can deal with. Of all the, addic all the addictive drugs, I don't know of any that have as good a prognosis for treatment as heroin. Certainly better than tobacco, better than alcohol, better than cocaine. And yet, uh, in the United States, there has been such resistance, and a large part of that played by the Drug Enforcement Administration, which has a very chilling effect on doctors' ability to prescribe opiates, and you'll hear more about that in the next talk, very important linkages to pain medication, that because of that chilling effect, we've been very restricted in our ability to open the effective uh, treatment modalities that we know about. So uh, I want to stop at that point and leave time for my colleague and questions. Thank you. As you all know, the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center is one of the most famous medical institutions in the world. Uh, you also know that cancer can cause great pain. When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer eight years ago, I read a description of bone cancer, which often follows prostate cancer that's not caught early. And I remember reading that it leads to a death of rare awfulness. I will never forget those words. Uh, I'll also never forget that when I had surgery, which appears to have been successful after eight years, uh, or four, eight years, a pert young woman told me that I could use the morphine pump by my side as frequently as every 15 minutes, that this was what these drugs are designed for, and that uh, it's not heroic. Indeed, it did not make sense not to use them. And I used it happily and was grateful that I didn't suffer much pain. Unfortunately, not every person suffering from a ser serious illness is able to get drugs that relieve their pain. Uh, Dr. C. Stratton Hill, who is a professor emeritus of the Department of Pain and Symptom Management at MD Anderson, knows a great deal about this, this subject. He's written extensively about it. He's organized conferences, and he has co-written the Intractable Pain Act, which was approved by the Texas legislature in 1989. But that didn't solve all the problems, and Dr. Hill will tell us about some of those that remain. Dr. Hill. Well, thank you very much, Bill. It's good to be here. and. Uh, I guess we'll have to shift gears a little bit because we're going to take we're going to be talking about positive things about these drugs. And most of the uh, stories that we've heard this morning have to do with uh, the perception that these drugs are all bad and that the law enforcement is out to uh, straighten the whole situation up. But what I want to talk about today is to emphasize the quality of life and how these drugs enhance the quality of life. And as Bill Martin said, it, was, it felt real good to be able to know that he could relieve his pain by his own actions. You know, one of the things that go along with pain is a great deal of anxiety. The anticipation that you're going to have pain. And if you have control of something yourself that can relieve your pain, then that reduces that anxiety and that takes away that component of the pain experience. But we're seeing more and more where there's an encroachment upon 
the quality of life by some of the same things that you're seeing in the prohibition of drugs. And uh, my thesis today is going to be that the therapeutic milieu that's created by government regulatory bodies and law enforcement agencies for physicians prescribing opioids for the treatment of pain is threatening, both administratively and criminally. And basically what we're seeing more and more of and what I'm becoming more involved with is the criminalization of the treatment of pain. Now, if you go back into history, we, you can see that uh, the opioids or narcotics, uh, the opioids is a preferred term, has a rather strange history because you can find that they were available and used back around the fourth millennium BC and their positive effects were uh, expounded and everybody seemed to think about this in a positive way. And in the, even in the 17th century, Thomas Sydenham, which is, who's been called the English Hippocrates, wrote, among the remedies which has pleased Almighty God to give to man to relieve his suffering, none is so useful, universal, and efficacious as opium. And of course, opium is the uh, basis for all of the uh, pain relieving drugs that we have. And in 1931, Albert Schweitzer wrote, we must all die, but, I, but that I can save him from days of torture. That is what I feel as my great and ever new privilege. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. Now, this morning it was uh, brought out, I believe, by Mr. Hutchinson and some that we didn't, it used to be that all drugs were not regulated. And the United States didn't feel like it, they need to regulate drugs until about the early part of the last century. Around 1906, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Law was passed, and all that law required was simply that the ingredients of the, med of the uh, compound, whether it was a drug or food, had to be on the label. And you could put strychnine in there, whatever you wanted to, but just as long as you put it on there. Well then, we, after we acquired the Philippines after, and as a result of the Spanish-American War, and the Philippine government was actually uh, dispensing opium only to the Chinese who lived in the Philippines, uh, the Episcopal bishop that was assigned to go to the Philippines didn't think that the government ought to be in the business of handing out drugs such as this. So that was the first time that there was some effort made to regulate drugs more than what the food and drug uh, law required. So the Harrison Narcotic Act, which was passed in 1914, was really the first attempt of the government to control drugs. And uh, the debate that was on the Senate floor was sort of prophetic about the, what, should, what might happen. And if I could have that first slide, uh, we can see that, you can't re I'll read this to you, it says, we must have a cure for the drug habit but we must not forget the innocent sufferer on his or her bed of sickness and pain. Let us protect the country from the physician or druggist who is encouraging the drug habit for purely commercial purposes, but let us not be too, by too much red tape, hinder the physician in the proper practice of his profession. We can prevent the abuse of the drug without unduly hampering its proper use. Well, there's sort of some hampering of its proper use has happened. This was uh, Senator Pomerani on the Senate floor on August the 15th, 1914. So nothing in the Harrison uh, Narcotic Act or in the subsequent Controlled Substance Act of 
1970, which I'll show you on the next slide, ever restricted the use of these drugs. Could I have the next slide, please? And I'll just uh, show you here, it says, this section is not intended to impose any limitations on a physician or authorized hospital staff to administer or dispense narcotic drugs in a hospital to main or detoxify a person as an incidental adjuvant to medical or surgical treatment or to administer or dispense narcotic drugs to persons with intractable pain in which no relief or cure is possible or none has been found after reasonable efforts. So that uh, shows you that there's nothing in these laws that restrict the use of our physician to prescribe these. Also, in the next slide, we'll see that in the DEA handbook, it even uh, says that there is nothing that should restrict a physician from using these drugs. What's that? 1970, Controlled Substance Act of 1970. Uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, we'll see that it's, it says here that, that the, this is the DEA handbook that they hand out to physicians, which says that there should be no restrictions on the prescribing of these medications. Now, the states have retained the authority to control the practice of medicine. So they have enacted medical practice acts. And what we found in Texas and in other states, at no time does the uh, act indicate that there is a legitimate medical use for these drugs. Only when we got the Intractable Pain Treatment Act passed here in uh, Texas in 1989 did we actually say that these drugs had a legitimate medical purpose. So if there's no interdiction or if these state laws and federal laws don't say that there's any restrictions on the physician using them, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that the interpretation that these uh, government agencies apply to the terms and the phrases that are in these acts are interpreted in terms of the illegal use of the drugs. Now, one of the m main phrases in, in both the state and federal law is that so long as the drug is used for a legitimate medical purpose. Well, who determines what a legitimate medical purpose is? The law enforcement agencies. In the bill that they tried to pass uh, that was aimed at stopping the Oregon law on physician-assisted suicide, it was named uh, by a phony name of the uh, Pain Control uh, Relief Act, Pain Promotion, con Pain Control Promotion Relief Act. Well, they were not really trying to promote pain relief because it said, yes, we want aggressive pain relief, but if you step over the line from aggressive pain relief to physician-assisted suicide, watch out. Now, who decided when you crossed that line? The DEA decided what the physician had in mind when they were prescribing these drugs. So a legitimate medical purpose is open to interpretation and what we see in many of the cases that I've been involved with in Texas, the uh, regulatory authorities, the Texas State Board of Medical Examiners, for instance, has almost complete unbridled power. When the, uh, if a physician says that he considered this a legitimate medical purpose, the medical board can simply say, well, it wasn't a legitimate medical purpose. And if the physician then wants to challenge that, then they, he will not agree to do what the board wants him to do, and then they can, he can take it to a court or to administrative law judge, and then to a court, but this costs him 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. And most of the time, they're so intimidated because of the bad publicity and so forth, they simply just uh, uh, kowtow to what the board wants them to do. There are other terms such as prescribing for non-therapeutic purposes. Who decides what's therapeutic? The board does. There's no definition. Although, in the uh, intractable pain, well, actually, in some rules that we got them to adopt here in Texas in 1995, we got them to uh, define what they meant by non-therapeutic purposes. And they said, well, that's describing that's not for a legitimate medical purpose. So it goes right back to the one that had to be interpreted in the first place. Prescribing that is not in the best interest of the public health and welfare. Who decides what's the best interest of public health and welfare? The board does. Practicing medicine that is not in the best interest of the public health and welfare. Prescribing to a known drug abuser or someone the physician should have known was a drug abuser. We talked about the, uh, the number of people who have AIDS as a result of uh, intravenous uh, drug use and getting contaminated needles. Well, in the Intr Intractable Pain Treatment Act in Texas, we had to uh, incorporate that in the first place that uh, we, they, this, these drugs could not be uh, prescribed to a known drug abuser or anyone who had a history of drug abuse. So that left the whole population of AIDS in which it was against the law to prescribe an adequate pain reliever to these uh, individuals. We went back to the legislature in 1997 and convinced them to amend that uh, Medical Practice Act so that this could be done. So you, there are many uh, results of these interpretations. And I think that I can best illustrate uh, these by some of the cases that I've been involved with and let you see how due process in the, for the physician or for the individual that may come before these boards uh, is trampled upon. I think the most egregious abuse of power that I've ever seen, and I've forgotten who uh, talked about, I think it was, uh, you're talking uh, about the S Seattle conference and uh, the doctors and the lawyers getting together. And uh, this is, happens to be though what happened with the Washington State Board of Pharmacy. There was a sheriff in uh, Snohomish County, which is just above Kings County in uh, Washington State, and he had suffered three major injuries in the course of his duties as police chief of the city of Snohomish and in, as the uh, sheriff of the county of Snohomish. Uh, a person had hit him in, a tele in the jaw with a telephone and fractured his jaw. He had to have this bone replaced. It was tremendously painful, and the pain was, going, was an ongoing pain, so-called neuropathic pain. Another time, he had fallen and broken his shoulder that required surgery. Now, this was not all at the same time. It was over a period of years. This remained uh, uh, painful, and then as he was debarking from a helicopter, he hurt his knee that had to have surgery. He had increasing intensity of pain over a period of time. A pharmacist decided that he was taking too much, too much pain medication and he reported it to the Washington State Board of Pharmacy. They then did a, they decided to do an investigation of the sheriff and that investigation consisted of doing, of doing printouts from the pharmacists in Snohomish County. And they, they, they came to the conclusion that he was getting drugs by fraud and deceit because he, was, he had several doctors, 
One, he had an oral surgeon for his jaw. He had an orthopedic surgeon for the two injuries we had here. And he had a family physician. They all knew what was going on among the three of them there about this patient, person having uh, the pain problems and getting uh, very, very weak opioid drugs for the, for the pain. However, they decided that this was abuse and that he was, that they should report this to the executives of the county in which he was a sheriff. Well, this was kind of dumb because they had no control over him. He's an elected official. He worked for the people, not the, the uh, county executive. So they told the, uh, these individuals, without his permission, without a search warrant, without anything else, and they conveniently leaked it to the press six days before his reelection bid for sheriff. Naturally, he lost the election. So the only investigation they had was a printout from the pharmacies of the county of Snohomish. And because their profile of a drug abuser, so-called doctor shopper, is to have more than one doctor. Well, would you want an oral surgeon to be taking care of your fractured shoulder or your fractured knee? So he had three legitimate doctors taking care of him. And at the deposition of the executive director of the Washington State Board of Pharmacy, he testified, it never occurred to me to ask the doctors involved, was it a legitimate reason for this person to be taking these medications? They talked to no doctors whatsoever. On the basis of these printouts and the profile of several doctors, and naturally he moved around the county being sheriff, and he knew the, the pharmacist where he could get the drugs the cheapest, so he went from store to store. He fit the profile. Well, they, he went, because it was a criminal charge of getting drugs by fraud and defreet, deceit, he went, he went before the judge, and the judge threw it out because they got the evidence illegally. They didn't have permission. They didn't have a search warrant. The investigator for the department of, for the pharmacy board said she had never had any idea this was a criminal investigation. And she was asked, has she had any instructions on how to conduct an investigation? And she said, well, I did attend a DEA course one time, but I don't, I'd never read the book that they gave me to read. So the sheriff then sued the state and the pharmacy board and was awarded $3.25 million. Now, that was a, a good story, except that he's never seen a penny of it because the state is appealing it every possible way they can. Another doctor that I was just involved with was in North Carolina. He's probably the most compassionate physician that I've ever known. I've known him for probably 15 years. Uh, he was, his practice evolved into a pain practice because patients who are, have severe pain problems, are some of the most vulnerable patients in our society. And no doctors want to take care of these patients. And therefore, when there is one that will take care of them, oftentimes patients gravitate to these doctors for, their, for help. Well, the, the DEA interpretation of this is that this is, these are script doctors. These are doctors that are easily influenced in order to get drugs for their illegal activity. So they uh, conducted a, an investigation into this uh, physician's practice and decided that he, had, he was indeed of the doctor's office. 
Now the question comes up to me, if they were engaged in this illegal activity, why didn't the DEA arrest those people out there in that parking lot? But there was never anybody that was arrested out there. So they took the doctor's DEA license away from him immediately, saying that he was, a, he was an imminent threat to all of his patients. What, what was the consequences to the patients? The consequences were that the uh, patients went into withdrawal. He could not refer them any, anywhere else because the DEA had confiscated their, their records and he couldn't give the records to the other doctors, so they wouldn't take them. So basically what I'm saying is that it's not so much what the laws said, say, it's how they are enforced by these agencies. And it's much m more likely that a doctor will get uh, a course in how to interrogate a criminal suspect than they will in how to assess their pain. We've got to take the, this power back and put it to the, so that people demand to get adequate pain treatment. Thank you. I think to, again, in the interest of, uh, of time, um, Rob Campia is the, the next speaker, and I think he's going to say some things that will, will pertain to medical marijuana. Um, so I think we'll have him speak, and then if we have a little time here for questions, you can direct them to these. We will also have a, uh, after uh, Marsha Rosenbaum's uh, last speaker, after her session, we'll have some time for questions of anybody that you, you'd like to ask them for. Rob Campy is the co-founder and executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project, which is based in Washington. And the, the project, which is one of the uh, key and much appreciated supporters of this conference, has focused much of its uh, energy and, and efforts and attention on medical marijuana, but also advocates, as others have advocated uh, today, that uh, people should not be subject to criminal penalties for using marijuana. And again, I'm happy to, where, where'd you go? Oh, there, <laughs> so I moved, I thought it was over here. So please welcome Rob, Rob Campia. Thank you. Uh, you know, the Marijuana Policy Project's position is that adults should not be arrested for using marijuana, whether they're sick or healthy. But we spend most of our time working on the medical marijuana issue because that's really where the action is in the legislatures and to some extent on the federal level. I'm a graduate of Penn State, but I do not have a football analogy. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't follow the Nittany Lions when I was there. Uh, rather than going into why the laws should be changed, I thought since I think there's a lot of folks here who already believe that medical marijuana should be legal, rather than going into the why and the who, I think I just want to discuss the what, sort of what is going on right now in the states, what is going on on the federal level, and what are we doing as, a, as an activist movement to try to move the ball forward. First, it's, it's a rare day that I get to speak to a crowd after having a series of victories. In the marijuana policy business, we're used to losing, not winning. And yet, um, on March 15th, uh, the Vermont House of Representatives passed our medical marijuana bill by an overwhelming majority. And the bill is now moving over to the Senate. Uh, we have already majority support in the Senate, but Governor Howard Dean, who is a medical doctor, opposes us. So. We think we can get the bill through the legislature, and we're already working on the governor's strategy. And this will all be wrapped up in the next month. So we're really busy trying to move this bill through. Uh, March 25th, the Maryland House of Delegates passed a similar bill, which removes the threat of prison time for patients who uh, need to use marijuana for medical purposes. And then on March 28th, this is all in the span of two weeks. March 28th, we won our lawsuit against the federal government for the right to run a medical marijuana ballot initiative in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Bob Barr, a congressman from Georgia who you may know and who f few of us love, 
He attached an uh, amendment to a federal bill which precluded D.C. residents from moving forward with uh, medical marijuana or any other kind of drug legalization initiatives. We argued uh, that that was unconstitutional based on First Amendment grounds, and the federal court in D.C. ruled on March 28th that we were right and he was wrong, and so now we get to move forward with our ballot initiative. To sort of frame the medical marijuana debate, really, after sort of years of debating this across the country, it re really boils down to two concepts. The people on our side argue that patients should not be arrested for using marijuana if they have the recommendation or approval of their doctors. For us, we talk about arrests in prison. On the other side, you have what I like to call FDA worship, which is uh, Asa Hutchinson and other drug warriors who say, we have the FDA approval process for a reason. If you think that marijuana has medical value, then why don't you do the research to sort of move it through the process, and then one day it can become a prescription medicine. That argument almost makes sense, except first, as Kevin Zeese pointed out, the federal government has blocked research over the past 15 years. And second, it's hypocritical to say that people who use marijuana for medical purposes should go to jail while people who use St. John's wort and echinacea and other herbal medicines uh, should not go to jail even though all these herbal medicines have not been approved by the FDA. So what we're saying is, sure, if you want to distribute marijuana through pharmacies and have doctors prescribe it, let's move it through the FDA. But in the meantime, do we need to be arresting sick people for uh, using or growing their own personal uh, quantities of marijuana? I think not. So. The reason that I think we're, we have such uh, success on the state level and how we're really building, I think, a movement is that the people are on our side. The people, I don't know if this is going to work. I have a degree in engineering, but I've never used one of these. So, you know, the, this is from Maryland. The legislatures are looking at this issue, and the people want them to pass these bills. We've done the Marijuana Policy Project has done 13 polls, 13 states, in just the past three months. All 13 polls show that the people support medical marijuana between a 60% majority. The lowest we got was in North Dakota. Only 60% want to see medical marijuana legal. And the highest was up at around 80% uh, in Nevada, so 79, 80%. And it already is legal there. And we were just asking the folks there if they like their law. And 79 or 80% said, yes, actually, we do like our law. So we believe that we're going to continue to see success on the state level. Just briefly, let me summarize what's going on. Uh, there are eight states that currently have uh, laws that protect patients from arrest. And a typical law is that it allows patients to use or grow their own marijuana up to certain quantity limits, usually six or seven plants, if they have the approval of their physician and if they have a certain medical condition, AIDS, cancer, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy. So that's sort of the typical medical marijuana law that is on the books in eight states. Also, uh, the laws allow a caregiver for the patient to possess or grow marijuana for the patient if the patient is unable to. The reason that these laws are actually effective, uh, even though the federal law prohibits medical marijuana, is because 99% of all marijuana arrests in the country are made under state law. Marijuana arrests are made by state police and local police. And there's only, only about five or 6,000 marijuana arrests in the country that are made by the feds. So when we're sort of debating this issue, we say, yeah, ideally we'd like to change the law on the state and federal level, but in the meantime, if we can just change the state law, we're solving 99% of the problem, and in fact, our good friend uh, Asa Hutchinson uh, was quoted when, in San Francisco a couple weeks ago when he was pilloried by the crowd there. As a way of backtracking, he said, and this is not an exact quote, but this, the concept is sound, he said, look, the DEA is not arresting people for medical marijuana. We go after the big guys, right? And that's actually true. The DEA is not arresting people for small quantities of medical marijuana under federal law. And that's a good thing. And so we take that into our lobbying game and we say, look, if you change the state law, we have the top cop in the country saying that the feds aren't going to come in and start arresting sick people up and down your state, so you can feel good about changing your state law. Now, 
under federal law, marijuana is uh, defined as having no medical use whatsoever. Uh, under federal law, cocaine and morphine have medical value, marijuana does not. Uh, this message, I guess, to the extent that children hear it, it's, it's that cocaine and morphine are better for you than marijuana. I think that sends a terrible message to children, sends a terrible message to our society that we have marijuana up in the category of LSD and heroin, and cocaine and morphine are available by prescription. So that's the state of the current federal law. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson is taking a proactive role in trying to ensure that we're not going to make progress on the state level. Uh, we have a copy of a letter he sent to legislators in Vermont critiquing our bill and arguing why the legislature should not be passing this bill on the state level. Uh, they're taking a very proactive role Luckily for us, the legislators are more sympathetic to the idea of not arresting patients than they are to propping up a failed federal policy that uh, really treats medical marijuana users the same as recreational drug abusers. Uh, so while his letter is being dis distributed and circulated, we believe, we hope, that it's not going to really have the impact that he's intending. The federal government is also doing something else that's disruptive and that is these raids on so-called cannabis buyers clubs in California. Some of you may have heard there was a couple raids in Southern California this fall. Uh, there was a couple raids in Northern California in February. And some people are saying, well, you know, this just shows that, uh, you know, the law in California isn't working and that the feds have had to come in and sort of rein in this chaos. But in fact, uh, what it shows is that the feds are making a distinction, like um, Mr. Hutchinson said, between small time users and distributors, is that the DEA, and this is a very important point, the DEA is not arresting individual medical marijuana users or their caregivers in California or any other state. And doctors are not being prosecuted for uh, recommending or prescribing marijuana in any state. The only federal action against medical marijuana, other than a lot of hot air, is that they are going after large-scale distributors and closing their doors. And even then, they haven't gotten all of them. Uh, so that's what's happening on the federal level. Uh, there's progress to be made in Congress. Uh, we have a bill that was introduced by Barney Frank from Massachusetts. It has uh, 30 co-sponsors on the bill. Um, if passed, this bill would allow states to do whatever they want in terms of enacting medical marijuana laws or not. It doesn't force states to do anything. It just says if a state wants to make marijuana medically available that the feds will not interfere. Uh, this bill has 30 co-sponsors, including three Republicans, one of whom is Ron Paul from Texas. Now, what we're trying to do to sort of build on this momentum from the states, where we have eight good laws, we have bills percolating through the legislatures, we're going to have a whole slew of bills introduced in the 2003 legislative sessions. We have that, and then we have the federal government that's intransigent. Uh, even though we have this bill in Congress, we don't expect it to get a hearing or a vote. So what we've decided to do as a, strate as a strategic measure is to use the DC initiative process as a way of forcing Congress to debate medical marijuana on our terms. Uh, Congress does not have the authority to overturn uh, state medical marijuana laws, but Congress does have the authority to oversee the spending and the affairs and the laws of DC. And so by placing a medical marijuana question on the local ballot, we are uh, in effect going to spark a congressional debate and vote on, on medical marijuana after we win the vote uh, this coming November in DC. This is an article from the Washington Post uh, on March 29th, which uh, describes our lawsuit and the victory and sort of how it's going to move forward into a congressional debate and vote. In sum, what will happen is that the voters of D.C. will pass this medical marijuana initiative by about 70 percent of the vote uh, this coming November. The reason that I'm guessing that is because in 1998 we had a similar measure which passed with 69 percent of the vote. Congress overturned it. So now we're starting over again. We're going to put it on the ballot, pass it. Congress is going to have to debate this and vote on it. And what we're hoping is that some members of Congress will be on our side because of the medical marijuana issue. And others will say, you know, 
I'm not necessarily supportive of medical marijuana, but I don't think Congress should be micromanaging the affairs of D.C. I believe that the folks in D.C. should be able to have the right to determine their own policies, even though I don't necessarily support it. And so we're hoping those two camps will add up to the votes that we need to protect our local law in D.C. And we expect that this debate will happen uh, sometime around November, December, or could even happen in early 2003. In closing, I would just like to bring this uh, back to Texas, I think that there's a real need for uh, the Texas community to take action on uh, medical marijuana legislation in Austin this coming session. I think if there could be an, another bill introduced, if there could be a good hearing, if we have opinion leaders in the state speaking out in favor of the bill, we have good prosecutors, police, uh, medical doctors testifying, speaking out, uh, if we could wage a sophisticated lobbying campaign, this will generate a lot of press, and I think it will bolster the efforts across the country. Because if Texas starts debating the medical marijuana issue seriously, and we did see the beginnings of that in the 2001 session, if we make real progress together in Austin in 2003, you know, it's just going to make an enormous impact upon what's going on in liberal Northeast. Uh, you know, it will really help mainstream the issue just a little bit more. And so uh, I would encourage you all, if, if you're... Uh, angry about the laws. If you want to see something tangible done in Texas, I'd say let's look to the 2003 legislative session, pick out a couple of bills that have a chance of getting a good hearing and a good vote, medical marijuana, maybe a marijuana decrim bill, and maybe a bill that would give treatment or uh, community service rather than jail for other drug offenders. Pick two or three bills, organize around those bills, raise the money, get a lobbyist, have opinion leaders speaking out in favor of it, and let's see what kind of good can be done in uh, the upcoming legislative session. Thank you. Okay, fine. We're gonna have uh, now a, f a few minutes to, if you wanna ask, since these are, are related quest uh, issues here, if you'd like to ask any of these uh, three gentlemen questions, then you can come to the, um, come to the, to the mics here. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dr. Drucker. I, your, uh, your data on, on, um, on uh, morbid or mortality for blacks, um, I, well, I assume Hispanics or, or Latins, I, I didn't catch what that middle line was in whites. It was, it was um, African Americans, whites, and others. And others, okay. Um, whites the, and others. Those, uh, those data would actually seem to go to an issue of severity and treatment availability. To, to some point. I mean, uh, people are having a problem that is more severe. That may go to the socioeconomic issues that, that were brought up before, uh, but also availability of treatment and availability of insurance and a, a variety of other things. Because under the guise of uh, treatment for other disorders, people can get treatment from, uh, for drug problems. Mm -hmm. So you're, the, the point that you're making, uh, you know, death is death, but the, but the the correlates of that seem to me much broader and related to uh, treatment availability. Uh, can you hear me on this? No. The, the, the main point I was trying to make with that is that it's simply more dangerous uh, for blacks to use drugs than whites in America for a number yeah. of reasons. But the, out, the, final, the final, the outcome is, is very decisive and dramatically different while the data on the prevalence of use aren't different. There are data about a, the intensity of use and patterns of use, likelihood of disruption of use by incarceration, access to treatment, all of that's certainly true. I guess I would, I would see those to be broader. And, and Dr. Hill, I, I, I would just point out that many of the problems that you cite are not actually problems. I mean, I, I'm firmly uh, averse to the DEA's management of things, uh, uh, but, but the problems you cite are actually problems of your colleagues. I mean, the pharmacist case that you cited, the, the problems you've had with physicians at, at MD Anderson, um, and who are those people? Those, are, those people are us. Uh, it is this culture, and, and I don't recall the phrase you used. I would say we are Calvinistic, but, but, but it's, it, is a, it is the medical culture as much as anything which pre promotes the very difficulty that's being discussed here. I couldn't I mean, agree with you. The DEA is, is sort of the agent by which all this harassment can occur, but the, 
the public and, 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 and the medical culture present the problem also. I couldn't agree with you more. The worst enemies we have are our own people, particularly in the pain treatments uh, area. The uh, pain doctors seem to delight to testify against another pain doctor because of the emotion that uh, surrounds the process that they may espouse. For instance, interventionalists, people who are, do nerve blocks and do other interventional programs. This was uh, happened in North Carolina. They, uh, a doctor like that will say to a patient, Mrs. Smith, I don't have anything more to offer you. Go back to your family doctor and he'll take care of you. But the rest of the sentence is, and when he prescribes opioids for you, I will be right down there to testify against him to put him in jail. And that's exactly what happens, is that the, the, the board of medical examiners will take the license away, the DEA will come along and file criminal charges against him for delivery of an illegal delivery of a controlled substance, which they consider that these patients who are, have these chronic painful conditions are drug addicts. And when they uh, stopped that doctor from prescribing and all of his patients went off drugs abruptly and went into withdrawal, that's of no concern to the DEA because they consider all those patients as being drug addicts. And all they're doing is saying, ha ha, we're, we're, we're ridding society of all these drug addicts and all of them have chronic painful conditions. They may have indeed have a problem with drugs, but they also have a painful problem. And therefore, they, they're really considered morally inferior human beings. Could I, could I add a sure. word? Sure. I'd like to add a word that, um, it wasn't said, but it's obvious that there's a connection between uh, the history of the use of opiates uh, for uh, um, recreational purposes, or pleasure, or um, what's called drug abuse, and the uh, medical use of it for pain. Uh, obviously, the, the use for, of opiates for pain antedates its use for pleasure for, for many centuries. But uh, in this country, uh, at, at the turn of the century, uh, the medical community was held responsible for the problem of drug addiction. And uh, by the time that that was firmed up in the Harrison Act in the pre-World War I period and right after World War I, when addiction was first recognized and the treatment of addiction using maintenance drugs was first being tried here in this country, the Shreveport Clinic that Judge Gray mentioned, uh, they came down like a ton of bricks on those doctors. And, uh, and um, the doctors who were genuinely trying to learn how to treat addiction using opiates were essentially driven out of practice. And that left a lasting message in the culture of medicine in this country. And I say in this country because that's not what happened in other countries, which had the same debate, but with quite a different outcome, the most dramatic being Great Britain, uh, where, where the College of Physicians successfully defended itself and defended its practice of both administering um, opiates for addicted individuals and administering them for pain. And I uh, maybe we'll hear from some speakers tomorrow about the international situation. Uh, and the ability to use these drugs uh, properly for pain management, uh, despite the development in this country of, of, of excellent technique of, 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 uh, pain, you know, of pain services now in many institutions, with one of the people like Russell Portnoy in New York, but always on the defensive, always at risk of losing their DEA licenses, which means they can't function, uh, and the fact that a, a, that a criminal justice division of the government should have oversight, as far as I can tell, sole oversight, among practice patterns, and, and of course the mechanism of that is the physician community who has been intimidated around this.
Well, let me just try again. Uh, I, I think that the, the history is relevant to the state of the art of practice. And the fact that physicians would more, I mean, I know that literature showing consistent under medication in hospitals of all classes of patients in general hospitals, uh, which says that it's a widespread problem. Why, why would that be the case with one of the most important functions of physicians is alleviating pain? Uh, it's one of the most frequent things they encounter. It's the thing that obviously patients care the most about when, they, when, when they're in that situation. Why should that be an area of such wide, and, we, and where the technology and the, and the methods are there, that actually if the efficacy is there, why would that be an area where there happens to be ignorance, like there happens to be ignorance about addiction? Uh, that's what I mean by the culture of this, and it goes back 100 years, it really does. Before the DEA. <laughs> I guess the test would be if that's universally true in medical practice in other societies. My but, impression is it's less so, but I could be wrong. Let me ask, we want to ask one more question. Maybe we can get a, a, a relatively short answer to this. Uh, but I think it's, uh, we've heard a lot in the last few weeks about OxyContin. And um, Dr. Hill, I think you're particularly concerned about this. What do you see the implications for the, the, uh, the, the flap over the use of OxyContin and what, what may possi what could possibly come of that? Well, <clears throat> OxyContin is basically the ingredient there is oxycodone, which has been available in this country for the last 70 years. Now, the OxyContin means that that's the, that the oxycodone is put into a contin delivery system, which is a long-acting system that releases that drug over a period of 12 hours. And it's very, very uh, excellent drug for pain relief. It's as potent, or probably more potent than morphine, and it has less side effects. So it's a more gentle drug, and therefore patients uh, do better on that drug. Now what's happened is that the abusers then will uh, uh, alter that system by crushing the, the tablet and that destroys the delivery system. So they get a full 12 hour dose all at once. And that has given them a tremendous rush of the drug and it gives them a tremendous high. And they, uh, we fought for years uh, with the FDA to allow a uh, sufficient concentration of a drug in these long-acting delivery systems. And we finally got to the point where we could get 160 milligrams in an OxyContin tablet. Well, that's a pretty good dose if you take it uh, all at once. And the people who, whose tolerance would not tolerate that died. Now, there have been about 300 deaths in the last two years as a result of this type of activity by people who are usually uh, psychologically impaired, to say the least. And uh, we have blown this uh, degree of abuse out of proportion and when compared to the millions of people who need this drug for pain relief. 
And this is a typical reaction to uh, a problem such as this in which we're saying, let's cut down on the availability of this drug in our society, and that will solve the problem. It won't solve the problem because if the drug abuser can't get OxyContin, they're going to the drug de jour, the one that they can get to abuse. But who suffers in the long run is the patient. And right off uh, the, and, and the nidus of these areas where this has occurred has been in the mountains of West Virginia and in Maine. And it had even been su suggested that life is so boresome in those areas that they've got to have something to do and they take drugs. And therefore, this is uh, what's uh, causing the problem. Uh, there is a bill that has been introduced in the West Virginia legislature to prohibit the uh, importation of oxycodone products into the state. That means that Percodan, Percocet, Tylox, Oxycodone, Oxycontin would not be available to the citizens of West Virginia. Now, there's probably been maybe 150 people in, in West Virginia that have uh, altered that drug, and as a result of sniffing it or mainlining it, injecting it intravenously, they've died. And uh, in order to solve that problem, the media and the law enforcement people have just taken off and said, aha, this is something we're going to stop this drug completely. Now, I think the only evidence that we have that we've done any good in our efforts to convince the physicians in this country to adequately use opioids uh, and that the drug enforcement people are, uh, have taken notice of this is that I think prior efforts, say 10 or 15 years ago, if this had happened, oxycodone would have been summarily taken off the market by the, by the DEA without asking anybody anything. And I think that we have had uh, meetings, 22 pain organizations had a meeting with uh, Mr. Hutchinson, and they give lip service to the fact that they are for the adequate use of these drugs. But then when it gets down to the enforcement techniques, they do what I have indicated, and all this intimidation comes in there, and physicians are just simply can't afford to take that risk. All right, thank you. If, sir, we're, I think we're going to move to the next session. We will have a session after that in which questions, if you can hold your question till the end, we want to make sure that Marshall Rosenbaum has. And thank you, gentlemen, for your contribution here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.